Hey everybody, Jeff here. I wanted to bring to you sort of a series of total beginner Capture One Pro training. This is, I, I decided that uh, maybe we needed just kind of a, a basic, you know, here's what Capture One Pro is, here's how you get images into the program, here's generally how it works, and uh, you know, you can kind of from there decide for yourself if it's, a, if it's a program that you'd prefer to use over some other image editing programs. I've been using Capture One Pro for probably more than 15 years now. And I love the program. Um, the kind of work that I do, I'm almost always tethering my camera to the computer to do my work because I want to make changes on set and sort of improve the file as we go along. But it's a program that can also import from card. So it's not just a tethering program, um, but it also can Tether, you can shoot to card, you can run around with your camera and CF SD cards and import those images right in, just like you do with Lightroom. Uh, there's a lot that Capture One can do that Lightroom is not as good at. Um, and conversely, Lightroom's probably been around longer in the catalog game. So if you're the kind of shooter that constantly shoots thousands of images to card and you need to upload and organize those, you know, like a wedding photographer, for example, maybe Lightroom is a better product for you, but then again, uh, Capture One has some things uh, that Lightroom's not as good at. So you kind of have to figure out the kind of photographer you are and what program is best for you. So let's assume that you have gone to the Capture One Pro website and you're going to download their trial. They have a 30-day trial. And from there, you can decide after you use it for a while. So you go and you download the program, you uh, get it onto your dock um, or pinned to your taskbar, depending on Mac or PC. And you can see here, I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna go, go ahead and open up Capture One Pro version 20 here. And on my Mac, it's gonna ask me a few things, little some hoops I gotta jump through. It's gonna ask me about software license agreement. And I'm gonna go ahead and accept my way through that. And I'm gonna go ahead and they, for Capture One 20, they give you sort of a, um, they give you a license code that you have to plug in. And so once you've plugged in the license key, the trial license key, and plugged in your email and, and uh, set that up with them, you probably have to go in and log in and just give them your email and set up a password on their website. It's gonna activate the program for you. More than likely, it's going to bring you to a screen that's gonna ask you whether you wanna start with sessions or catalog. We're gonna talk about sessions first. We'll get into catalog in another episode of this. Uh, sessions, I find, is uh, probably the easiest way to work with Capture One Pro. Think of it in terms of a specific job. You're going out to shoot a specific thing and you're gonna drop your images that are of this particular thing. Let's say I'm gonna go for a hike in Glacier National Park on a particular day. I would set up my session year, month, day, Glacier National Park. That would be my session, knowing that I can get to that and know, oh, on that date, I was at Glacier National Park hiking around, all of those images associated with that session. And then when I drop that, onto my hard drive, I can go through and I usually have hard drives by year and I can say, oh, in 2019, oh, there it is that time I went to Glacier. So that is sort of the session workflow. The catalog workflow looks almost nearly identical to Lightroom in the sense of the way that they set it up. Just some of the nomenclature is a little bit different. So that's just something to, to realize is that it's really pretty similarly organized to Lightroom. Um, it just some of the names are a little bit different little bells and whistles are a little bit different from Lightroom. It usually brings you to this pop-up page here, the resource hub. So once you have a session going, that session is almost always going to default to your pictures folder. And we'll look at that in a second. But I wanna have a little bit more control over that. I don't just want the program to choose where my session is going. So in my scenario here, you can see the resource hub pops up and you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner, it says show on startup. So I have the ability, if I want to see this resource hub pop up every time where I have the option to maybe buy some presets, maybe there's some training videos to watch, I could certainly have that show every time I open the program. I don't personally need that, so I'm gonna uncheck that option here um, because I don't need it. To get rid of this ad, you can see here's tutorials, webinars, support, places to buy other things. I'm gonna uncheck show on startup, but know that that will be an option for you to not have the resource hub popping up all the time. Okay, so here is basically the interface of Capture One Pro. Whether you're uh, in a session, the catalog looks pretty similar to this as well. Um, the, the main thing is, is I 
don't necessarily want this particular session named this way or set up this way. Um, so this is kind of a dummy session. On the Mac, you can see if I hold the command key and I click the little folder at the top here, it shows me a little hierarchy of where this session defaulted to. But I don't necessarily want to put it there. Um, there's no reason for me to put it in there. You can. You can certainly say, well, that seems like the most logical place to put all of my photographic work is in the pictures folder. Uh, but you want to be careful in, you know, in that you just want to be deliberate about where you put this stuff. You don't want to just like assume that the program's going to do the right thing. Um, in many cases, I just run this right off of the desktop. Pictures folder is fine. Um, a lot of the pro users will actually use a, a shared folder that can be accessed from any of the login users on the machine. Um, that's a, a nice way to work as well. But for our intent and purposes, we just throw it on the desktop, knowing that we would take this and back it up to an external hard drive later. Um, so this is where it lives. And so I'm going to just navigate over to that right now. I'm going to come to my Finder and open up my Finder window, and I'm going to get over to get to my users and my pictures folder. And you can see here's this capture one dummy session that lives here. And inside of it, this is the default setup, right? So I don't necessarily really want uh, this session to be here in my pictures folder or to be named this. This is probably a session I'm just going to throw away anyhow. So I'm going to select it and I will dump that session. I don't need it. And with capture one, I'm going to come over here to the file menu and I'm going to create a new session, OK? I'm going to say File, New Session. And it says, yep, can't save that session. That's right, we just deleted it. That's OK, we're creating a new one. Now, this is where I can choose. In this little window, it says Location. I'm going to hit the little ellipse. You'll see this ellipse show up a number of times in the program. And it's, I guess you could say it's kind of like the hamburger menu, the little stack of paper menu you'll see in some of these software programs, or the control on the Mac, the control key. Um, so is like the right click on a PC where it brings you to a menu of other, other options. The ellipse here is kind of like that in this pro program. It gives us access to other things. So it's asking me, where would you like this session to be sent? I'm going to put it on the desktop, OK? And just for now, say choose. And then I'm going to name this session. So in this case, I'm going to say today's date, 2020, March 21st. And we'll call it um, C1 Pro Session session one. This is our first session. So you'll see that this folder is going to go to our desktop. And inside of this folder, if you look here, it says capture subfolder. It'll be named capture. That is where the raw images are going to go. That's the important thing to remember here. There is going to be another select folder there. Uh, there's going to be another subfolder there called selects. And the selects folder is a, a, just a folder there that you can put your selects into, the one, the, your hero shots, the chosen ones. Um, and it takes it out of the capture folder and puts it into that selects folder if that's a workflow that you want to adhere to. Uh, when you go to export a file, say a, a JPEG or a TIFF or a PSD, some, one of these other uh, types of files that you might need for the internet or print, it's then going to default to go to this output folder. The nice part about Capture One is it creates these defaults just so that you don't get messed up from the beginning. Uh, you can always designate other folders on your machine or on other hard drives for any of these. You could send your captures to a different place altogether. You could send your selects or your output or your trash to different folders on the machine. This is just the sort of fail safe, use this method and know that it's always there. I've stuck to this over the years, and it's always worked out fine for me. Um, sometimes when I'm working with other entities, they might have me set it up a different way, and that's fine. Um, it's about knowing that this is all really customizable. You'll see that there is also a trash folder. So when you delete an image out of the program, it doesn't just disappear off your machine. It just gets moved into the trash folder. It's when you move it out of that trash folder, uh, that's when it actually deletes it off disk. So it's kind of giving you a little bit of a safety net there. And you'll see it has just sort of a default capture name here. It's set up. Uh, we can go ahead and click OK, and it'll create this new session for us. Now, you'll notice here that if I look over here on my desktop, here is that folder, right? And if I double click this folder and take a look at what's in it, we'll see that there is the session file itself. This is kind of like if, you've, if you're used to working with Lightroom, uh, the Lightroom catalog file, right, is holding all of the changes that you've made to the images. And that's similar to what this co-session file here is. It's basically the, the 
mini catalog, you could say, of this particular session. Uh, if I were to double click that while the program's off, it would open up that specific session with those specific images in it. And you'll see in the capture folder, that's where all my RAWs are gonna populate. If I export an image out, it's gonna go into my output folder. If I designate something as a select into that folder, it's gonna go there. That's sort of a, if you wanna use it sort of thing. And then there's the trash folder, whereas I'm deleting a file, it's gonna go into that trash folder. So that's, you know, and then if I had something I did tomorrow, I could certainly have a dated folder for that. And it's a nice way to kind of keep things organized. So well, let's take a look at this now. This is Capture One's interface. And you'll see that there are these little widgets right here that control a number of things. If I look at this far left one, this is my library, okay? And it has a list of all the sessions that I may have created recently. And I can remove those. I can also create a new session from this little plus sign to add a new session if I'm midstream and I need a new session. And you'll see here my session folders. This is indicating, this is pointing to those specific folders on the desktop that we were just looking at. Just like in Lightroom where you have these different collections, we have these albums in Capture One that we can create, which that at that point is virtual organization. We're not moving anything on disk. We're just using the program to help organize ourselves. And it's not actually moving files around inside that capture folder, which is nice. And then it shows you the actual system folders, the root level folder area. We don't necessarily need to work, worry about that right now. So I'm just gonna collapse that little carrot there. We look at this next item here and it's the camera window. And the camera window tells us a number of things. It'll give us a histogram. It'll give us camera information if we have a camera attached and I can open and close these. Uh, it'll give us a certain amount of focus ability with certain types of cameras and lenses. Um, it'll show us more information about camera settings, and it gives us a place to name our captures as well. So if I'm shooting in a tethered workflow with a cable connected to my machine, I can actually name the file before I take my first shot. So if I'm, let's say, doing some food photos and there's a particular naming convention that my client wants, I can plug that name in right there in this window and it will populate on all of my raw files and all of the processed files the same name, which keep, helps to keep the organization going. So that's the next capture naming. I can come here to my capture location and it gives me, tells me this is where they're going. So that's handy. And various adjustments I can make. Um, so I can change the orientation or various color profiles uh, for these particular captures that are populating in. And then there's some other advanced tools, overlay and capture pilot and things like that, that we don't need to worry too much about. So what we're looking at here is where the main image would come up if we choose it. And on the right here is where our browser is. We have the ability also to customize it and have the browser at the bottom if we prefer that, kind of the Lightroom method. Let's talk about or importing an image. Let's say you've been out there and you've been taking pictures and you have a bunch of images on your card and you take that card out and you get it into your card reader and you plug it into your computer. And what's gonna happen here is it's gonna pop up an import dialog. Okay, it wants to say, yep, do you wanna access this? And here's my import dialog and here's a number of images that are on this card right now. And I'm gonna look up here into my import from, right? And it's defaulted to this EOS digital, which is nice. It recognizes that I plugged in this card. I could choose to include subfolders if I want, if I thought there was more than one folder on there, see what else is in there. And I could choose to exclude duplicates uh, if I had imported into this session and I didn't bother to format my card. I went out and I shot some more and then I come back and plug it back in. It can exclude the things that it already recognizes on the card. So that's nice. Then it's asking me, where would you like to import this to? Okay. And it can see here that it's sample path saying session folder, right? So I'm going to come here to import, choose folder, and I want to just say, well, where are we taking this? We're taking this to that capture folder, right? We're going to navigate here, desktop, there's my session for today, the capture folder. And I'm going to choose set that as the import folder, please. And some other advanced features give the ability to uh, have an external hard drive plugged in right now and back up to it as I'm importing. So I'm importing to the folder on my desktop and it's also copying those to an external hard drive at the same time. So that would allow me under backup enabled to choose the location and send these files to an additional session that's say on a hard drive uh, to back it up. So that's a nice feature. 
I can name them on the way in. You know, in the event that maybe I don't want them all to say CRW with some naming convention, uh, I can choose a different name for them. We'll look at that in some of those tokens later. Metadata, I could choose to have my copyright. So I could come in here and say Option G 2020, Jeff McLean. Okay. And I could choose to have a description if I want. I'll just keep it simple with copyright. And adjustments, I could if I wanted have a style that's applied to everything. This would be a handy thing for say wedding photographers that have a particular sort of filmic look to their work. They have a style preset that they like to use. Uh, some of these different companies um, out there sell different types of presets. Capture One has their own styles that you can purchase um, that kind of emulate old film looks. Um, Fuji, Agfa, Kodak, different types of film stocks that had a particular look about them. So it's trying to emulate some of that. And that might be a handy, you know, I can see wedding photographers who have a particular sort of, uh, you know, Fuji or Kodak or what have you sort of filmic look to their work that they, you know, or Portra is a good one, you know, Portra 100 or 400, they can actually import their images and it immediately applies that style right off the bat. So they're already working with kind of a consistent look. And then from there, it's just tweaks of exposure and contrast and things like that. So that's an option here for you. And then it gives you the file info. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna say, let's go ahead and import all down here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and inject the card. I almost never choose erase card images after copying. That's just, I like the fail safe of knowing that those images are still there on the card in case something weird happens. Uh, or if I'm working on a desktop machine and the power goes out and I'm not connected to any kind of backup power and my computer shuts off midstream, uh, I don't wanna all of a sudden have a truncated file and that happened to be the hero shot that I, I wanted. So I'm, I I'm pretty much never choose erase images after copying just cause that always makes me a little, uh, uh, makes me a little nervous, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and choose import all. So the images will pop up in my browser off to the right. You'll see here as they come in. And it's nice because they come in in this numerical order and I can you know, go through these different images and see what is going on with them. A variety of images. Here's one that has like a color checker card and then the one after, we'll look at that. And landscape and this dog image. So we have a number of files to work with different kinds of images here. And you'll see that it gives me some information here. At the top, it gives me red, green, and blue. Um, so I have my RGB scale at the top so I can make some assessments over color as well as exposure. Uh, the browser over here, you'll see that when I select on an image in the browser, it puts this white border around it. And that's what's known as being super selected. Uh, right now, this one is super selected. If I were to hold the command on the Mac or control on the PC key and choose a second image, you can see I can show two up at the same time um, if I'm looking to do some comparisons. If that not, doesn't work for you, just pay attention up here into this little corner of the screen where you see this little set of boxes. That allows you to toggle multiple view where you can see multiple images on screen at once. If it's set to the singular um, icon here, you can only look at one of these at a time. The one that is super selected here is the one that'll come up. Um, but to be able to see multi at the same time, you have to have the little four box four up there going. But you'll see over in the browser that one is also highlighted here, but it's not as bold in white. So this one is the super selected image. So if I were to make any changes, it's gonna happen to this architectural shot, not to my rodeo shot here. So th that's something to be aware of in the browser. So if I'm used to the Lightroom way of working where I have my browser at the bottom, like a film strip, I can get to that under the view menu you see here, I come to the view menu and I come down to this item browser, customize browser, and I can say place below. And it takes my browser and puts it on a film strip down here at the bottom, which is probably a little more akin to the Lightroom method. You'll see that instead of uh, navigating as a film strip that goes off to the right here, I, I toggle downward or scroll downward and you'll, I'll see more images. Uh, me personally, I'm used to the uh, having the browser on the right, so that's how I'm going to do it. Um, so I'm gonna place my browser on the right. So now that we've gotten our images off of card and into the program, let's take a look, a real quick look here. Here's our session folder that we created. If I open it up and I look into this capture folder, there they are. They, those are the raw files that are now 
in that folder. So as long as I don't delete that folder, I'm safe. Don't delete that folder. You want to keep that capture folder around and always with this particular session. So don't separate those from one another. Just so you can kind of understand what the folder structure is in this program. Now, if we were to do like a basic edit, let's look at, say, this rodeo image here. So I can look in, into these widgets up here again, and you'll see that there is one that looks like a lens. So this one is going to control a number of things, it's going to control chromatic aberration, um, some diffraction corrections, maybe some purple fringing. Um, I can adjust some cropping and keystoning in here, rotation and flip, and I can get a grid on this if I want as well. Now, if I go to the next item here, which looks like these three little circles, little color, uh, color wheels here, you'll see that we have a layer section. We'll talk about that in another video. We have some base characteristics, which are basically some sort of default recognized uh, items. This is seen this particular shot. Um, it's appending to it a uh, EOS 1D Mark III ICC profile because that is the camera that was used to photograph this particular shot. Okay. And you'll see that we have white balance here and it's defaulting itself to 5120 with a negative 1.2 tint. And so that's something that we could adjust on the fly or we can white balance off of something white in the shot. We also have the ability to make adjustments to the overall color of the file or three-way. We have these three-way where we can adjust color in the shadows, the mid-tones, and the highlights for not only corrective measures, but also for uh, some creative measures if you'd like to. We can take things black and white by enabling the black and white, and that way we have some control over the tonality. We can get into split toning, which is nice. And then we have a color editor, which we'll get into in another future episode as well. But let's say I just want to do some basic, you know, sort of shadows and highlights and exposure sort of look. We come to this little exposure, which looks like a little histogram mountain range. And again, we have this layers option that we're going to look into in a future episode. White balance is there as well. And we have now our exposure. So a lot of this is very similar to Lightroom um, in the way that you work with it. So if you're used to Lightroom, you're kind of exploring this program, don't be afraid. Just jump in and start working with it. Um, you know, toggle that exposure to see what that looks like. As I start tweaking this information around, I can maybe open up the exposure a little bit. Maybe I want a little more contrast, just a little more snap out of it. And maybe I want to pump the saturation, but I feel like I'd love to see a little bit more of the shadows open up so I can come here to high dynamic range and I can choose the shadow slider and I can open my shadows up a bit and get a little bit more of what I feel like my eyes were able to get out of the shot versus what a camera could capture. So that would be sort of a basic edit to an image after we've imported it into the file. Now let's assume that with this shot you say, oh, well, they all came in you know, Canon raw files or whatever their, their naming convention is coming out of the camera, but you don't want it to be named that. You would like something different than this sort of like garbledly gook number. You can actually come right over here into the browser to that particular file and you click on it and it highlights it for you, allowing me to say Rodeo 001. And that's what I've named the file now. And you'll see I've called it Rodeo 001. If I look back into my capture folder, you'll see that it's changed that raw file's name to that now. So you have to be deliberate about this if you are in a workflow where you, you need to keep track of uh, you know, certain raw files. You would never want to separate, you would never want to rename your processed files something different than your capture. That's when you'll lose your raw in the mix of things. You always want to make sure your raw is named something because then as you make JPEGs and TIFFs, PSDs down the line, the naming will stay the same. And if for whatever reason you need to get back to the raw, you can find it easily um, on your system. So this was part one of a series of Capture One Pro videos that I'm going to be doing. Um, this was basically, let's get some images into the program and um, let's do a little basic edit on it. In our next series, we'll look at tethering. We'll look at organizing images um, in different ways in the program. We'll look at exporting images out. Uh, so stay tuned for the next video. So if you like this video, hit the thumbs up. If you didn't like it, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe. Subscribe to more of our content. You can hit that little bell. It'll notify you. Uh, thanks to Canon for providing some of the camera equipment to make these videos possible. Thanks for watching.